I suppose that was a warm welcome, but I haven't felt warmly welcome to Wheaton yet. But, uh, but it really is great to, uh, to be back here and to talk to you uh, about some very basic things that uh, should shape our, our own patterns of spiritual formation as we think as sisters and brothers in Christ about what it means to follow Jesus in a, in a multi-faith world. I'm going to be basing these three talks on drawing guidance from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 18. I won't read the passage here, but I encourage you to think about this passage together uh, in your own uh, private devotions, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 18. Today, I especially want to focus on what verse 15 uh, means for us. That verse 15, 1 Peter 3, 15, was a very important part of my evangelical upbringing, uh, especially the first part of that verse. Be always ready to give to anyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that lies within you. you know, stand up for the truth. Be faithful to the gospel. Make sure you know how to make your case. And that was, a, that was a, good, uh, a good set of guidelines for the Christian life. But, you know, very often uh, people fail to go on to the next part of the verse. If you look at the NIV, it goes like this, but do so with gentleness and respect. The NRSV says, but do so with gentleness and reverence. And as we're... Uh, articulating the reason for the hope that lies within us with people of other faith communities, other worldviews. What does it mean for us to, uh, to know who we are and to know what we believe, but at the same time to make our case with gentleness and reverence? President Reichen uh, referred to a book that I wrote called uh, Uncommon Decency, Christian Civility in an Uncivil World. And I was first motivated to, to write that book as I was thinking about issues of civility in American life and in the global situation. And, and I was especially helped by a, a couple of sentences that I, that I got from the great uh, University of Chicago historian and uh, Lutheran theologian, Martin Marty, who in one of his little books says, uh, you know, people today, who are civil often don't have very strong convictions. And people who have strong convictions often aren't very civil. And what we really need is convicted civility. And I want to talk about what convicted civility means for our encounters with people of other faith traditions. Because the theme for this three-part Missions in Focus series is uh, following Christ in a multi-faith world. And we evangelicals haven't always been good at the gentleness and reverence part of it. So today I want to talk about the spirituality that we need to cultivate in order for us faithfully to approach people of other belief systems and other faith perspectives. How do we cultivate this gentleness and reverence when we're talking to our Muslim friends, our Hindu friends, our Buddhist friends, our, Judas, our, our Jewish friends. And the first point I want to make is that it's so important for us to think about God's gentleness and reverence for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Tim Keller has a wonderful story that, uh, that he tells about uh, standing at the door at Redeemer Church in New York City a greeting people at the end of a worship service and a woman sort of lingered off to the side and when everyone, when everyone else had finished uh, shaking hands with Tim Keller, she came up to him and she said, I just want you to know I'm not a Christian, but I've been coming to this church for the last couple of weeks and I'm gonna keep coming because I really have learned a lot from what you're saying. And he said, well, tell me about it. Uh, why are you as a non-Christian coming to this service? And she said, well, I work on Wall in Wall Street and I'm in a senior management position. I, I report to the vice president of the company, and, and I really screwed up badly on something a couple of months ago. And, I, and my vice president, to whom I report, and he and I were both called in to talk to the CEO, who was very upset with me. 
and was chewing me out. And suddenly the vice president to whom I report said, you know, you really need to direct that toward me because it's not her fault. I'm responsible for that decision. And she said the CEO kind of toned it down a bit and it went pretty well after that. And as we left the office, I turned to him and I said, you know, I've been this, in this business for many years and never before, she said, there have been many times that I've taken the blame for things that other people have done. But never before has anyone taken the blame for what I did. Why did you do that? What motivates you? And he said, well, I'm a Christian and I have a savior who took the blame for me. And she said, when he said that, I said to him, well, where do you go to church? And he told me, and she said, I, I wanted to find out what that's all about. And I'm still learning. We have a savior who, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it's so important for us to begin to ground our, our convicted civility toward people with whom we disagree in that, that deep sense of gratitude for a God who reached out to save us when we were very unlikable while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And then secondly, to think about our own shortcomings. You know, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139. It's a great airplane psalm, by the way. If you take an early flight, uh, it's a good psalm to start with. Oh, if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, thou art there. If I ascend above or descend beneath, Oh, you are there with me. Oh, Lord, I can't escape your presence. Yeah. Uh, that can be kind of scary at times to know that we can't escape God's presence, but it's also a comfort to know that he is always with us. And the psalmist gets quite worked up. I mean, he tells how much he loves God's thoughts and how he wants God's great thoughts to be reflected in his own way of thinking and like. But at a certain point, he gets, he gets on a kind of a role in condemning the enemies of God. And at a certain point, he says, Lord, I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred. You and me, God, we're on the same side. You can count on me. I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred. And it's as if he pauses. And then he says this, Lord, search me and know my thoughts. Search me, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And as we approach people that we may consider to be enemies of the faith, representing worldviews and theological perspectives that are very different than our own, and we might be tempted to say, you can count on me, God, I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred. It's always important to stop and say, whoops, just a minute. Lord, search me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's so important for us. And that's that self-corrective thing. As we enter into dialogue with people of other faiths, and I'm going to talk about some of the basic rules of dialogue uh, tomorrow. But as we enter into dialogue with people of other faiths, it's so important for us to recognize our own faults and, and, and we need to hear from them. I've worked for a number of years with the American Jewish Committee in Los Angeles on a number of projects, especially issues relating to uh, First Amendment freedoms and the like. And I had a meeting with a, with a rabbi, came onto the Fuller campus, came to my office, spent about an hour and a half together. I thought it was a perfectly ordinary and excellent uh, conversation about uh, freedom of religion and freedom of expression and the like. But a week later, I got a, I got a, a letter from him. And he said, I want, you to, I, I, want you to, I want to tell you how grateful that I, am, that I am for being able to feel safe with a Christian. He said, I was raised in a small town in Minnesota. We were the only Jewish family in town. And he said, I was, uh, and, and every day in those days, in the public school in that little town in Minnesota, the teacher, who was usually a, a Lutheran, uh, would begin the day by saying, boys and girls, let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to say. And they would pray the Lord's Prayer. And he said, I was instructed by the rabbi in the next town over where we went to worship that I was not to say that prayer. 
So it was very obvious that I was different than all the other kids in the class. And he said, on the way home from school, they would throw rocks at me and they would call me a Christ killer. He said, walking home from school was one of the most frightening experiences of my life because there were too many Christians around. And he said, when I walked onto the Fuller campus, an evangelical Christian campus, he said, I broke out into a cold sweat. I just remembered those days. But he said, I felt safe in your office and I want to thank you. You know, we need to hear those those lessons. I, I was so proud of uh, I know this was somewhat controversial at the time, but I was so proud of uh, former President Lippmann when he when he led the way in changing the name of the Crusaders at Wheaton College. How deeply offensive we don't realize it how deeply offensive that word crusade or crusaders is to our Muslim friends. Billy Graham organization has recognized this as well, and so they don't talk about evangelistic crusades anymore. It's important for us to know the history of our own faults. Uh, 2,000 years of, of anti-Semitic persecution often of, of Jewish people. It's so important for us to reflect upon our own thoughts in the past, our own sins. And then to go beyond surfaces in looking at people, you know, one of my favorite theologians, uh, John Calvin, the great Reformation uh, theologian. And at a certain point in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he's, uh, he's talking about just war theory. It is the idea that wars do have to, on occasion, take place, but they have to take place, they ought to take place in accordance with certain standards of of justice. And at the same point, he says in that discussion, when a political leader, a national leader, is thinking about going to war, there are two preparatory exercises. They're really spiritual exercises that that leader ought to engage in. He said, first of all, the leader needs to look into himself or herself. For Calvin, it was always himself. The leader uh, needs to look into himself to be sure to examine himself, to see whether he's being guided by any illicit passions. Is he motivated by just revenge? Or as Calvin put it, implacable severity. Is he motivated by a a desire to grab somebody else's land and using a war to uh, cover up a kind of stealing, an act of stealing? Look into yourself and check out your own motives. Search me, O Lord, and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me as I'm thinking about going to war against an enemy nation. And then he says, and the other thing you need to do is to reflect on the common humanity that you share with your enemy, that you really are talking about human beings who are created in the image of God. Now, Calvin was a good Calvinist. (laughs) And he understood two things about our, our depravity, about our sinfulness, and that is that we have a tendency to put the best possible interpretation on our own motives and the worst possible interpretation on the people that we disagree with. And Calvin says, just as a kind of spiritual exercise, reverse that a bit and check into your own motives and admit your own faults and then reflect on the humanity that you share in common with your enemy. And you still may need to go to war but only after those very important spiritual exercises. That's so significant for us as we anticipate having dialogue with the people with whom we disagree. And it's important to begin with that attitude of uh, search me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then also to reflect on the humanity of our Muslim neighbors, of our Hindu neighbors. You know, there's that tendency to to generalize and treat Islam, for example, as as an abstraction. When I know from my own experience in Southern California that whenever the United States is in a hostile relationship with a Muslim nation, little Muslim kids in Orange County, California get beat up on the way home from school. We need to reflect on what it's like to be afraid to walk home from school because you're a Muslim or you're a Jew or you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, to reflect on the common humanity that we share with our enemies. And that means 
going beneath the surface. One of my favorite spiritual writers, I quoted John Calvin, so now I can get away with quoting a Catholic nun. Uh, one of my favorite uh, spiritual writers is uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux. 19th century, 15-year-old girl decided she wanted to be a Carmelite nun, to go into a Carmelite cloistered community. She was a little too young to get in, but she so pestered the bishop, and finally he turned to the Pope in Rome, and they decided, ah, go ahead, you can join. It was a good thing because about nine years later she died, of, I think tuberculosis, but she spent those nine years in this Carmelite community, and Teresa of Lisieux was passionately in love with Jesus. And she wrote this uh, wonderful uh, set of spiritual reflections. I think it's published usually as The Journey of a Soul or The Diary of a Soul. And in there, she talks about what it means for her to, to see other people the way Jesus sees them. There's one passage. She says, one of the nuns here manages to irritate me whatever she does. I know the devil must be mixed up in it because it was certainly he who made me see so many disagreeable traits in her. And since I didn't want to give way to my natural dislike, I, I told myself that charity should not only about be a matter of feeling, but should show itself indeed. So I set myself to do for this sister just what I should have, should have done for someone that I love most dearly. Every time I met her, I prayed for her, and I offered God all her virtues and merits. And this great line, I was sure this would greatly delight Jesus, for every artist likes to have his works praised, and the divine artist of souls is pleased when we do not halt outside the exterior of the sanctuary where he has chosen to dwell, but that we go inside and admire its beauty. To, to see that none that she doesn't like as a, a work of art by the divine artist. My wife is an art historian, and my, my son says, our son says that that means that his father has sat on the steps of some of the great art museums of the world. Uh, I'm aesthetically uh, challenged. Uh, I'm learning. Uh, that story about my sitting on the steps got so well known that one of the retirement gifts that the trustees at Fuller Seminary gave us was uh, a, a year's uh, membership in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and a specially designed pillow with a handle on it that I could take to sit on the steps when I wanted to. Uh, but when we see a Louise Devilson or a, a, a Picasso, my wife understands it right away but I need, I need work. Uh, art appreciation for most of us takes a lot of work. And the kind of art appreciation that goes into recognizing other people as works of art designed and created by the divine artist takes a lot of work. And it's spiritual work. It takes prayer. It takes meditation on the common humanity that we share with our enemies. It takes, it takes that kind of spiritual work, and it's so important for us to engage in that kind of work so that we can show that gentleness and reverence toward others. And then finally, it's got to start in very ordinary ways, you know. I mean, just as uh, St. Teresa, you know, she's talking about some nun in the same community that she didn't like. Maybe, maybe you have people here this morning you don't like, and it's important for us to, uh, to begin on that very level so that when we encounter real disagreements about who God is, who, about who Jesus is, about whether we're sinners or not, and whether we're saved by grace or by works, that we're, uh, we're prepared for that by having worked on that in very ordinary relationships. When I wrote that book on uh, civility, uh, one of the, the, the kinds of incivilities that I had in mind were uh, the big ones in the world. This was about 1990, early 1990s. Catholics versus Protestants in Northern Ireland. Jews and Muslims in the Middle East, Christians and Muslims in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. You know, those big conflicts. And what does it mean to show convicted civility in those big global conflicts that were very much in the news. My book came out, about three weeks after it came out, I got calls separate, 
they didn't know about uh, each other, what they were doing, but a reporter from the New York Times and another one from the Boston Globe, and they, wanted, they were writing pieces on civility, but they didn't want to talk about Muslims and Jews or, or, or Catholics and Protestants. They wanted to talk about parking lots. They wanted to talk about freeways in California, you know, road rage, the, the very basic incivilities that people show toward each other in the, uh, in the aisles of a, of, a, of a supermarket or a mega store parking lots. I talk quite a bit about parking lots and incivility with these reporters. A couple weeks later, I was pulling into a parking lot to go to a grocery store, and I saw a, a crowded lot, and I saw an empty space, and so I pulled into it, and as I pulled into it, I heard somebody honking the horn at me, and it, it, very angry. It was a woman driving a car, and she'd obviously been waiting for that spot, and I just cut right in front. I hadn't seen her. And she shook her fist and actually lifted one finger uh, in her hand uh, and uh, obviously was very angry with me. And uh, I got out of the car and I watched where she went and she found a parking space uh, pretty far away. And I walked over and she was just getting out of the car and I said, ma'am, I'm the guy who just took your parking space. I didn't know that you were waiting. I am really sorry. I did not mean to be so rude. And she started to cry. He says, just let me alone. Don't bother me. She said, if you knew the kind of day that I've had, said, just go away. So I walked away. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard her say, sir. And I turned around, and tears streaming down her face. And she said, thank you. And boy, I felt good about myself. You know, I write books on this. <laughs> yeah. But I don't just write books. I, I do it myself in parking lots, you know. Two weeks after that, I was returning a Hertz rental car at an airport. And I just made it in under the deadline, waiting for the guy to check my car in. And you know, if you're an hour late, you gotta pay quite a big fee. And I was just about three minutes before that new hour began. And it was a young guy, and he was talking to a rather attractive young woman driver and he went beyond three minutes. And when he punched his little hand computer, he said, I'm sorry, sir, you're late. You're going to have to pay the extra hour. I said, I am not late. I've been here. You, you, you could have seen me if you hadn't been talking to that woman. And he said, I'm sorry. I've got to do what the, what, what the computer tells me to do. I said, well, I'm not going to pay it. Well, not my fault. It's your fault. I was here on time. And suddenly a middle-aged African-American woman, his supervisor, came over. He said, what's going on here? And he said, this guy doesn't want to pay. And he was late. And I said, it wasn't late. It was his fault. I was here in perfectly good time. And, and I, I went going on and on. And then finally she said to the young man, just go away. I'll take care of this. And he handed her the thing. And she looked at it. And she said, you don't have to pay. It's OK. And I said, of course I don't have to pay. It wasn't my fault. You're not doing me any big favor. She said, honey, you need a hug. <laughs> and I want to say this. If we're going to get at the big issues of following Christ in a multi-faith world, sometimes in the very ordinary events of life, we need to say, to somebody that we're angry with, or somebody who's angry with us. Honey, you need a hug. Thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>